Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. I'm very excited to see this. I missed it the first time around. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank it you for- It was busy at Reclaim, so it's kind of hard to, <laughs> it's kind of hard to see them all. That's why I'm glad about the streaming as well. Yeah, yeah. And I'm th thank you for coming back to re-record. Um, this yeah. is very exciting. Uh, yeah. yeah, so Lee scalar Bissett is here today to represent her presentation from Reclaim Open, The Future is Minimal. Um, Lee, do you want to introduce yourself and just talk a little bit about what's yeah. up here? Yeah, gladly. Um, I, as I said, I'm Lee Scalar at Bassett. Uh, I am the Assistant Director for Digital Learning at the Center for New Designs and Learning and Scholarship, also known as CANDLES, uh, at Georgetown University. Uh, prior to that, uh, I worked at uh, the University of Mary Washington at the Division of Teaching and Learning Technologies. Um, and yeah, I'm going to talk today about the future being minimal. I'm glad to have the chance to re-record this. Um, so that I'm presenting it at a reasonable speed as opposed to the hyper speed I was trying to present it um, uh, at it at uh, the Reclaim conference. And uh, yeah, so let's just dive in and get started about how the future is minimal. Sounds good. Awesome. Take it away. Yep. All right. So uh, you can access these slides at a bit uh, at the bit.ly. Uh, slash capital M minimal, capital E ed, capital T tech. Uh, the references are in the notes uh, to all of the Google slides. So again, they're, uh, they're there for you to, um, they're there for you to peruse and read up more uh, about what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I am ready writing on uh, pretty much all of the socials that we've been forced to sign up for, like Blue Sky or Threads or Instagram or Twitter, if you're still there, or Mastodon. I'm ready writing there, too. So uh, find me on any of the socials uh, if you have questions or you want to talk more about this. Um, so before we get into the idea of minimal, I want to talk about big ed tech. And this was done by, uh, this was posited by Ben Williamson in an editorial about how big ed tech has set up the narrative that they are inevitable, right? Big ed tech is inevitable. They've completely taken over our narrative and our imagination for the future. There is one story, it is the story put forward by big ed tech, um, and that it is just going to keep getting bigger, um, bigger and more computing power and... Uh, more environmental uh, destruction, uh, more surveillance, more, more, more. It's always going to be more. Um, they've got uh, billions of dollars in marketing behind them to be able to uh, reinforce the inevitability of this particular uh, narrative. We, uh, Silicon Valley more generally, wants tech, uh, tech solutionism still for all of our problems. The answer is always bigger, better, better, quote unquote, um, at, uh, technology. Um, and so one of the things that, that Williamson says is that we need to start imagining differently for our future. And uh, we need more and better stories about what our future could be. And so part of what today is, is that it is getting us into a different mindset for thinking about different futures, for breaking from the big ed tech narrative that has been, uh, po like I said, posited as inevitable and that that is so inevitable that we have trouble thinking outside of this narrative. And so today is about really trying to break from that. And the way that we want to do this is a thought exercise that involves the concept of minimal computing. Now, minimal computing is a concept that comes out of the digital humanities. Um, and again, this, it's, a, it's a shame that in a lot of cases, uh, digital humanities and uh, ed tech units on campus typically don't speak to one another. Um, you know, we have uh, very much that um, digital humanities is, is largely concerned with research and research projects, although digital pedagogy is starting to make its way through. Um, and ed tech is in UIS or uh, your IT departments. Uh, we, we call it UIS, University Information Services at Georgetown. Um, and then, of course, the digital pedagogy exists somewhere in between, sometimes in teaching and learning centers, sometimes in their own unit. But very rarely do these three um, 
do these three disciplines, these three professions, these three units on campus, uh, rarely are they in discussion with one another. Um, and yet we all have a shared interest in um, the technology that we use to teach, to learn, to do research, to run the institution. And so minimal computing came out as a response to that, from the, as a response in the digital humanities to the unsustainability, both environmentally, but also um, accessibility of a lot of big DH or digital humanities projects, how they require a lot of computing power, how they require a lot of manpower or person power, I should say, how they require programmers and um, support and long-term funding, whereas the product that is created then is not accessible to people in the developing world who might have, or, in our, or even in our own backyards, who don't have access to high-powered computers, that don't have access to high-speed internet, and maybe don't even have access to uh, projects that are held behind a paywall. And so when we talk, when they come up with the concept of minimal computing, is they're talking about just um, making accessibility and sustainability at the heart of the question. And so what they're talking about when we talk about minimal um, is, you know, you can see the list. You've probably been looking at it while I've been rambling on about the very brief history of minimal computing. Um, and but what they want instead in terms of access in terms of maximizing access accessibility justice negotiation mobility etc cetera, etc cetera. want to empower users to be able to create to be able to access to be able to in a lot of cases democratize uh digital humanities and so i've always been really really interested um in that kind of concept um because my thinking is, is what if we took the concepts of minimal computing and applied them to ed tech? What if we thought about minimal design, minimal use, minimal construct, consumption, maintenance, barriers, internet, externals, automation, space, and technical language? What if we applied these concepts to thinking about ed tech, right? Go in the exact opposite direction of the big ed tech now narrative and go small, go minimal. What would that provide for us when it comes to our, um, when it comes to our thinking? And the other thing that I really appreciate about the minimal computing movement in the digital humanities is that they talk about wanting to break open the black box of computing about how things are done, how you'll have computer experts and the academic experts, um, but the academics don't necessarily understand about the computing and the computing experts don't necessarily understand about the, um, about the academic side, the research side, and nobody really understands how it works, right? It's, it's uh, auto magic. The people who think that the internet is, mag is, uh, is magic and will make anything happen but not understanding how or why these things are happening. And I think we see a lot of that as well in ed tech, right? Um, you know, most people don't understand that Canvas is just websites behind a firewall, right? That it's coded in HTML, which is the basis for the web, right? Um, that our websites are database uh, and not flat HTML. Right? These are things that uh, most people don't understand about the web, don't understand about the tools we use. And so in applying this idea of minimal computing uh, to ed tech, we want to be able to um, think about even our uh, learning management systems uh, or VLEs. Is that what they're called in the UK? Anyways, the, the canvases, the blackboards, the Moodles, the D2L, um, all of those. Um, and so here's a quote about from Sean Michael Morris from um, What If Bell Hooks Designed an LMS, uh, is that, the, you know, the problem is that whether we are using Blackboard or teaching in Canvas or building domains project, we are most likely not doing thinking that is liberative enough. The point is not just about platform, the point is about praxis. And that's really where we can also come into this idea of minimal computing and imagining ed tech through a lens of minimal computing um, to be able to make the point about praxis, right? 
where we can imagine something um, that is built around what exactly our needs are. Now, an example of a minimal computing platform developed for uh, in the digital humanities is uh, is a platform called Wax, and Wax has been developed as a um, alternative to Omeka. And Omeka is a popular uh, digital humanities tool. It was developed at George Mason University um, by library and museum uh experts it was developed uh to prioritize metadata and to be able to create exhibits um, but it is run off of a database it's run off of a database and an awful lot of plugins uh it requires a, a tremendous amount of server space uh and there is quite a, a large learning curve and most of the time uh, developers need to be involved in the uh, building and maintenance of a major omeka exhibit and so enter Wax. Wax is done on, as you can see, it's hosted on a GitHub, um, uh, this particular uh, site. It is flat HTML. It is built off of a spreadsheet um, with some uh, bootstraps. Now, again, this still uh, requires some technical knowledge. It takes some more of a learning curve to set it up, but once it is set up, it is lightning fast. Um, it is... Um, it is sustainable long term, and it can also be maintained by people who are not technical experts, right? There is no plugin updates that will break entire sites. Um, there's no uh, access issues. It could be put on a thumb drive as flat HTML and looked at on a browser um, that isn't connected to the internet. Um, so these are all uh, considerations. I invite you to go um, and explore and look at Wax and what it can do. Uh, but it's not a teaching tool. Again, you could use it as a teaching tool in the same way Omeka is used as a teaching tool. But it's not a teaching tool, right? And so what we want to think about here is, again, um, you know, the question was, what if we apply the concepts of minimal computing to uh, to a platform like Omeka? Now, what I want you to think about and the prompt that I have for you and the prompt that I want you even to bring back to your own units is the following, right? What if we thought about ed tech through the lens of these four questions? And these four questions come from Risa McGill uh, in a recent special issue of Digital Humanities Quarterly devoted to minimal computing. Um, they were again applying it to uh, the digital humanities, but I think these four questions are really great, um, are, are really great prompts for us to think differently about ed tech. And those questions are, what do we need? What do we have? What must we prioritize? And what are we willing to give up? Right? What if we imagined a future of the institution around the kinds of technologies in ed tech we will be using that prioritizes these four questions. What would it look like? What would it be? How can we imagine this future? And what I really want you to focus on is not all of the ways this could never work, right? Because that is not going to help us break out of the big ed tech narrative. It won't. So we need to really think about where we want to go, what it could look like, and then we can start figuring out ways to get there. But right now, we don't even know where we want to go. And so these are the kinds of questions that we need to, ha uh, that we need to ask and address in order to start writing different futures. And so what could ed tech look like in the future if we applied the concept of minimal computing? What we have here is a uh, link to a Jamboard. And yes, it's not very minimal of me to be uh, locked in the Google ecosystem, but bear with me. We use the tools that we have available to us uh, until we can imagine differently and, and apply it. Um, and so this is a locked version of uh, what was said at um the reclaim open conference um we ended up having a uh i went through that a lot faster and i allowed for about 20 minutes i think 
for people to discuss in small groups and share on the Jamboard. Now, I'm leaving that Jamboard closed for now because what I'd like you to do is in uh, the Discord chat or in the little chat that's next to the screen, I want you to share your futures for it with the people who are here thinking about it. And as I said, I want you to bring this uh, back. There's a, another reason why I made my slides available is because I want you to start having these conversations with your units, with your faculty, with your students, with your administrators, to start being able to imagine differently about, uh, about the future of ed tech. Start imagining it differently. Now, before I sign off and allow you all, I, I, I apologize that I'm not going to be there uh, to moderate the discussion uh, in Discord. Uh, I'm going to be at a conference about WordPress, of all things. Um, but before I leave, I want to uh, leave you with two, uh, two visions. One of them is the platform hacks that I hope that you um, listen to. Uh, earlier on, uh, I really invite you to go and rewatch the hacks, hacks, um, the WordPress killer um, presentation because I think that that is a perfect example of imagining differently and not just imagining differently, but implementing differently. I also share uh, a little bit of my own vision from a presentation that, or sorry, from a publication. Uh, on minimal computing uh, access and online learning. So not necessarily just ed tech, but online learning, but th think about it within the lens of, of um, ed tech as well. And I'm gonna do the cardinal sin of reading off of a slide, but uh, that's where we are right now. Imagine that instead of paying millions for enterprise solutions and the people to support them, the institution invests in more and different people who are experts in learning design and minimal computing to assist faculty members in building their distance courses differently. Instructors are already struggling with the technology provided, largely because it is bloated, complex, and unintuitive. So why not embrace a more inclusive and environmentally friendly approach and support of minimal computing? What if institutions did not have to pay, did not have to pay not only for the software programs, but also for the server space to run them effectively, instead relying on lower bandwidth and less complex digital and technical solutions? What if both faculty members did not require the most up-to-date and powerful computers to run their online courses, understanding that there would be those doing research and teaching courses that require more processing power, but because their minimal computing courses would be accessible even with basic software process, programs and processors? And what if we invested in more staff who would support instructors pedagogically using this approach? So again, I um, thought not just about a minimal computing to individual courses for online learning, but institutionally what it would look like um, in this essay and, and pause it and ask these questions. And I, I don't really answer them, but not, and again, that's what I'm, I'm inviting you to do here is to, as I say, imagine differently. And so again, um, I welcome any and all, uh, imaginate imaginative futures, uh, around, uh, minimal ed tech approaches in the discord and I'll go back and read them. Um, I also, again, uh, invite you to do more reading up on the concepts of minimal computing. Again, um, there's lots of great references in this slide deck, uh, in the notes and, um, to start, uh, to start, uh, firing up your imaginations and to really break that, um, break that big ed tech narrative. So thank you so much. Um, you know, let's go for a, a, a brighter, more minimal future. Thank you, Lee. That was great. Thanks. Yeah, I I really liked getting to I, the we had the Hack CMS uh, presentation recently rerun mm -hmm. last week, I think. And this is really cool to see. In the context of that, you talked a little bit about Hack CMS, but thinking about just sort of Wax as an alternative to Omeka. And I know there were a lot of conversations that came out about how to sort of 
scale down, as you're saying, yeah. minimize your digital footprint and think about other better, more sustainable ways of doing things. Yeah. Well, and, and Tom Woodward um, had his presentation. So it's funny at the Reclaim Open Conference, there was my minimal computing. And then immediately after in the same room, there was Hacks <laughs> was presenting. And um, so there you can actually hear in his presentation, there's a bit of a dialogue there because I had literally just finished speaking. Um, and now I'm going afterwards so I can reference back to it, which is fun. Um, but also reference forward where Tom Woodward talks about how your website is a carbon bloat, uh, bloated carbon spewing, um, huh. you know, monstrosity, he, something like that. Yeah. Monstrosity, yeah. It, where he talks again about a lot of the same things around um, the environmental unsustainability of mm -hmm. um, not just our websites, but big ed tech generally. But you know, I came, I really was looking at it initially from an accessibility standpoint around low bandwidth, low computing power, mm -hmm. um, the concepts of digital redlining, um, you know, uh, the, the idea that the majority of the world does not actually have uh, the latest iPhones or smartphones, but actually are using um, $5, you know, Android phones. Um, mm -hmm. so, so again, thinking about, you know, we want to be able to make our courses, our tools, our materials accessible and maximally accessible. You know, again, that's the thing we cut down on the reliance on database, on high powered processing, on all of that kind of stuff. Well, then we maximize accessibility, right? And so there's, there's that push and pull of the trade-off. Um, we also minimize surveillance, right? Which is another yeah. big thing that is coming up on the, on the conference. Um, surveillance takes a lot of computing power. That was one of the accessibility debates around Proctorio, which we're going to hear about um, in the, one of the keynotes for the, the virtual conference. And, you know, we learned during the pandemic, um, you know, what kinds of computers, what kinds of bandwidth, what kinds of, um, you know, privilege you needed to have, even just to be able to run Proctorio the way some faculty wanted to run Proctorio, mm -hmm. right? You couldn't run it on your phone, could run it on your tablet. You had to have, you know, a, we a working webcam. You had to have a stable internet connection. You had to, you know, all of these kinds of things mm -hmm. that a lot of people just didn't have access to during the pandemic. Um, so again, like we and and we can have a whole and we will probably have a whole debate. And there's another one about privacy and all of that kind of stuff. But you know, again, if we if we minimize that, then what do we gain, right? And yeah. I think that that's that's one of the core questions as well, and and one of the core concepts that minimal computing and the digital humanity was, was trying to get at is of what if we if we give up all of these things, mm -hmm. what do we gain? Yeah, and that's why I also like those four questions. What are we willing to give up? And I, I, I'm just thinking in terms of like the fact that we are lucky enough to have these resources and sort of take them for granted means that we can sometimes use them for, as a shortcut for doing rather than putting in the work that you're talking about to build these. And it's really not that hard. There are tools that people are making available like Wax, like Hacks that, to make why do they all have X's at the end? I don't understand. But anyways, that's yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a branding thing. It's a funny, yeah, it's a branding thing. X is minimal. <laughs> mm. um, but, but the idea of um, as we get used to having huge amounts of processing power and resources like that, we use it as a, a sort of a crutch to avoid. Yeah. We don't have to think about efficient design as much because our concept of what is efficient has changed because well we have all of this available to us yeah what does it mean to be efficient and to be minimal i don't know yeah no and i mean <laughs> we, i have this conversation again i i mentioned how a lot of the times faculty and even some students think of the web as a magic yeah right that there's a wand i can wave my 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 internet wands Mm -hmm. and make the website do whatever they want it to do. And so I, I teach a class on, uh, with students on, build, on helping them uh, think through and build their e-portfolios. 
uh, in our learning design and technology master's program. That's the other mm -hmm. thing I do. I teach in our learning design, uh, learning design and technology master's program at Georgetown. And, um, you know, we do a lot of work on, you know, digital identity and all that kind of stuff. But when it comes to actually building the website, the students very often have these grandiose plans for interactivity and slideshows and autoplays and, you know, all of these things. And I'm they're like, can I do that? And I'm like, yeah, there's probably a plugin in WordPress, but do, do you want, do you need to do that? Right. What it is, is add? Yeah. What, what does it add? Does it help? And so we, we work on, you know, again, I, I love core questions, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, who is this for? Yeah, you know, who's the audience? You know, what is it for? Um, it would, or what's your purpose? And then ask, does this really have a value add to be able to address what it is, the people that you're that you're trying to reach with the message you're trying to reach them with? Yeah. Right. Just because yeah. you can do something, is that why you're doing it? Does yeah. that Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, the there's and and sometimes the answer is yes. Right. Like there are very, you know, like I even said, there are some faculty who are doing, you know, if you are teaching a course on databases, well, you're going to need some computing program to uh, and a program to run MySQL. Right. Yeah. That's equal. That, that, yeah, that's fine. But if I'm teaching a literature class, do I need the most high powered computer to run um, to house a bunch of PDFs to read and, and a few YouTube videos that are about it? Right. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't think yeah, so. Exactly. So, you know, it, it, I would say 90% of the cases, um, much of what an LMS provides is overkill. Yeah. Right. Like we are trying to kill a fly with a, with a, you know, um, a, you know with a sledge, I was going to think bigger than a sledgehammer, a cannon. Oh yeah. No, that, you know, you know like let's go bigger, um, <laughs> where, you know, and, and the cannon's all we got. So we're just going to shoot the cannon at every every problem we have. Um, where, he's, sure, it probably solves some things. Um, and, and again, that's where the questioning comes in. Is like, what do we actually need? Mm -hmm. Right? What are we willing to give up? And sometimes you need the things, right? You need the LMS. You need, you know, again, I was talking about Proctorio. Well, we have a nursing program. And in order to remain accredited, they need to have proctored exams. Mm -hmm. Right. That is not our decision. It's not even the nursing program decision. It is the accrediting body that has said you need to have this. And then that becomes the need. Mm -hmm. Right. We, you know, we're not going to we, we want an accredited nursing program or else what's the point of having a nursing program? So therefore, we need proctoring software. Mm -hmm. Right. And so there's there's always going to be some needs, but that doesn't mean that everyone needs it. Yeah. And that it is the best answer for everything. And and again, the, 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 that big ed tech narrative is like, no, 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 it is the answer to everything and anything. Trust us. Right. We know best. Look at how rich and powerful we are. We must be right. Um, and so, again, it's it's really getting outside of that narrative, mm -hmm. thinking outside of that narrative, imagining outside of that narrative and trying to create um different visions and different futures and and this is just one prompt right the minimal is the one that i've been drawn to because of these questions of accessibility is because um you know i like putting stuff from different disciplines and fields in conversation with one another and this one seemed particularly fertile for me but it's not the only one but i just i really want people to start imagining differently yeah so I guess that's been about a half an hour. So, um, and, and that again, seems like imagine differently. That's the perfect note yeah, to imagine end differently. On. That's exactly it. And, you know, keep the conversation going in the discord, um, ping me on various socials. As I said, I'm ready writing. This is, um, I'm currently, uh, it's closed, but I'm currently editing a special issue of learning media and technology, um, with my colleague Rupika Reesum at Dartmouth on minimal computing and ed tech. So look for that in 2024, cause you know, it's a journal, so it'll take a while, but <laughs> um, already really excited about some of the submissions we're getting. And I think it's gonna be, uh, again, just more, uh, more fuel uh, for the imagination. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Lee. 
Thanks everyone. Take care. Thanks everyone. Bye.